Let's pray this morning. God, I pray that you would give us a sense of the grandeur of your church, your plan for this world, and God, our part in it. God, I pray we would see you today in glory, and God, know you and love you, and God, be inspired and empowered by your spirit. God, as we hear this word today, I pray you'd, you'd make that word like flame, make our hearts like grass. God, just burn right through. God, make, make it unmissable. God, make it moving and, and powerful and personal. And God, when we leave here, may our will be focused and determined. May we be determined that we will not fail at this calling you've given us. God, may our hearts be stirred, drawn towards you. And God, may we have a keen sense that what we do is not in human strength. It is in the strength of God Almighty who will accomplish His purpose. God, I just surrender this time to You and I pray that You, God, do something to us and through us, in us today that's clearly, unmistakably You. For Your glory, God. For our good, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder sometimes if we have any idea at how big a thing God has enabled us to be a part of. I mean, I wonder sometimes if we even begin to see the scope of this, what an incredible thing it is to be where we are right now in the time and place that God has allowed us to be as part of His church. I mean, the church of God, I don't mean one local assembly of people, and I certainly don't mean a, a building, but God's people collectively, God's people that He is given His Son for, for their salvation and life. The church of God is the plan of God for the salvation of the world, and God's church will prevail. It will succeed. It will accomplish its purpose. And sometimes I wonder, if we ever stop and think and open up our view and see the big picture, what an incredible thing it is that God lets us be part of this. That I'm part of this, what God has done. Sometimes I think our focus becomes so incredibly narrow, so incredibly self-serving, that we think this grand plan of God that God allows me to be, be a partner in is really something very small and it's just about me. It's about my convenience or comfort or my will, my desires. And we lose sight of the grandeur of the plan of God. And today I want us to step back and I want us to see the picture. There's this small city, this small ancient city. And if you were an archaeological student, if you were a historical student, if you were looking at this from just purely human or secular terms, you'd find nothing, nothing remarkable about this little city called Colossae. Very small in size, very little in impact, just a little market town. But Paul, under God's inspiration, sends a letter to the church there under the leader of a pastor named the name of Epaphras. And this letter is so powerfully challenging, so powerfully convicting about how God works, what God is about and how God, in mercy unknowable, grace bigger than we can put our finger on, invites people like us, you and me, to be part of it. And there's a challenge here that I want this to just stick with you as an umbrella over the next several weeks as we explore through this book of what God really wants from all of us. And I hope, and I want to challenge you with this, commit this verse to memory. I want you to think about Colossians 1.10 today and tomorrow and the days to come about what God really wants for us and what Paul was praying for them and by extension us, that here's what would happen, that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and that all of our lives and everything that we do, that all of life would be fully pleasing to Him. To walk worthy of the Lord, a manner that's worthy of God. Let me think about this this morning. God is not calling you to work for this salvation. What God wants instead for you to see is how complete is His salvation and how it gives you everything that you need and how if we really understand it and have genuinely received it, it ought to change the way that we live. This is, this is something we ought to walk worthy of. What a, what a prized possession God has given us to be saved. One of my favorite historical movies is, is Saving Private Ryan. 
It's so powerfully moving. And you see just the, you see the real blood and guts horror of war, and you see the raw emotion involved. And if those of you who know the story remember the basic storyline, a young man has lost his other brothers in combat. And so a special mission is sent out to bring this one brother, this one remaining brother out. So this poor family won't lose them all, won't lose all the sons. And so there's this special group, this group of army rangers dispatched to the front lines of battle to find this private and bring him home safely. And if you fast forward to the end of the movie, you can picture this scene. And and here's this this army ranger captain, bloodied and bruised as his platoon shot up. Great sacrifice has been made for the rescue of this one person. And the culminating in that movie, he leans over and tells him this. He says, earn this. Earn this. But you know what? I don't think an army ranger would ever say, earn this. You see, from the founding of the rangers, they've had a motto. And it's a two-word Latin motto. It's sua sponte. And what sua sponte means is, I chose this. I chose this. Each of those men who were rangers were volunteers to be rangers. And they knew the cost, they knew the sacrifice, and they willingly made it. And when Jesus looks at me and you, with bloody hands, with a nail-scarred head, with a bruised body and a spear mark in the side and holes in the feet, He doesn't pick us up by the face and say, look at what I've done, now you earn this. What He says is, I chose this. I chose this. In a little while, we're going to share in an ages-old, 2,000-year-old form of remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. We're going to do like millions of Christians do and have done, and we're going to take a piece of bread, and we're going to take a cup, and this bread is going to remind us, and I hope it'll go beyond just what we know in our heads and go to our hearts, that there's a real man named Jesus sent by God, more than a man, God himself, who stepped out of the throne where he was judged and instead stepped into the dock and became the judged and exchanged himself for us, a substitute, him for me and him for you. And that little cup, it's a little cup, a little cup of red juice, reminding us of something incredibly profound, the depths of which we won't really understand until we're standing face to face with God himself, that God chose his own son to be a sacrifice, slayed for our sins, his blood given to pay for it all, every wrong I've ever done. And what he says to us at that moment And what he's saying to you today, not earn this. I chose this for you. But since you've been given this, that you understand fully what this is. Walk in a manner worthy of this. In a manner worthy of this. I don't know what all of you do as far as occupations are. And I don't know what all the other components of your life entail. For some of you, I only see you on Sundays, unfortunately. And I don't know how you identify yourself I don't know how you introduce yourself to someone, but I will tell you, if you belong to Christ, your primary identity is that. It's that you're part of the company of the redeemed of God. You're one that God has loved. You're one that God has revealed himself to, and you have responded in faith, believing, and he's given you something that, as much as you feel grateful for it today, it transcends our understanding. In the context of this letter, Paul is writing to us to remind us about the big picture and how the big picture ought to affect every single thing we do. Let your goal be, let your prayer be, that you will walk in a manner worthy of that which God has given you. This treasure that transcends treasure. And that everything that you do will be fully pleasing to Him. And and that's not just a faraway goal. That's not just an end-of-life goal. Because those end-of-life goals, they're all well and good, but it's too easy to put off the decisions that are necessary now to reach that goal. Everybody in this room would like to finish well, but not everybody in this room is doing what you need to do right now to finish well. You want to stand before God one day and have lived a life that's fully pleasing to Him? You've got to please Him today. You've got to make a decision today to do what God wants you to do and to say no to something that God is saying, don't do that. Some of you know in your heart you shouldn't do. 
You've got to make a decision between two things that may seem morally neutral. God, which is pleasing to you? How will I know? Because I'm going to pray. And I'm going to discern. And I'm going to counsel with those who are wise. Because here's my, here's my commitment. I know that God saved me of great sin. And I know I could never do anything to unsin. I can't earn it. But because he's given it to me, I refuse to fail at pleasing him. I refuse to fail at honoring him with my life, of walking in a manner pleasing to him. So here Paul writes this letter. It's this little church, and a letter now that has penetrated the hearts and lives of millions upon millions of people, and will continue to do so. Colossians chapter 1, here's what he says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. I'm going to stop there just for a moment. He says, we always thank God for you because we know that you have faith in Jesus Christ. We know the faith you have is real because it shows up in the way that you treat people, the way that you love people. It's not an emotion, it's an action. By this will all men know that you're my disciples, Jesus says, that you have what for each other? Love. That you demonstrate this love for each other. So he says, I know you've got it and I know it's real. And he said, this hope that you have is stored up for you in heaven. Listen, some of you may have come in today to this service hoping that maybe through a song that you like or um, an encouraging word from somebody, um, maybe something I would say, maybe you get a little snippet of something that would give you a little boost. You know, just, just a little lift because you're feeling down and you're feeling ungrateful or, or just, just pain ridden right now, angst ridden. And you wonder sometimes when we talk about thankfulness, what have I got to be thankful for? And Paul lays this down for them and for us in a timeless way. He says, I'm always thanking God for you. Even when life is hard, even when you go through great pain, even when there are things that are happening you can't possibly understand because this much I do know, you have life in Christ and that life is eternal and it's held in the hands of someone so much greater, so much stronger than you that it can never be lost. It's in God's hands. And so no matter what else is going on, in your worst moments, when you feel like, God, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say thank you for. You thank God for that, that you belong to him. He is yours and you are his. And in his grip, you will remain permanently. And one day you're going to see him and know him face to face. He says, this hope laid up for you in heaven. He says, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he's made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is what God is about. This is what God is doing. And so here's this church struggling with these little conflicts and, and these, these petty debates and, and these, this false teaching that now has sprung up and has taken their heart away from God in passionate pursuit of Him and it's robbing them of the enthusiasm and the zeal. It's, it's causing what God has planted, which was a movement designed to go out into the world with and, and crush its resistance to something now that's turning on itself and people fighting and debating and it's all turning and changing. And so he reminds them, here's the big picture. I think of Jesus in a story I recounted to you a couple of weeks ago where Jesus, remember again, where Jesus is with the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. And he does an opinion poll of sorts and he asks them, so what's the word on the street about me? What are people saying now? After all the things they've seen and heard, 
What are you guys hearing while you're out there? Who do men say that I am? You remember the question? Who do men say that I am? Two interesting answers came. Well, some say that you're Elijah, which is rather spectacular and supernatural because Elijah was a prophet. They were looking forward to his return. So maybe you're the returned prophet from the dead. Others say you're John the Baptist, which would be even more spectacular because John the Baptist has just been beheaded recently. And that's a little bit creepy to consider, but maybe that's what you are. People don't know. They, they, see the, they see the smoke, but they don't understand the flame. So Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? What did Peter say? Peter, in a moment that was given him by God, because that's what Jesus says, his flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Peter. You didn't sit down in your little mind and conjure all this up. God put this in your heart. That's called revelation. He says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Peter. What did God reveal to him? Peter said, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, Jesus, you are it. There is none other. There's no other salvation. There is no other plan of God. You alone, Jesus, are it. You're everything. You're the fulfillment of everything, the promise of God. You're our sole hope. You're the answer. You're it. And what did Jesus say to that? He said, Peter, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the rock wasn't a man named Peter. The rock was the revelation of God and the profession of faith of a man who said, you're Christ, you're it. He says, on that foundational truth, I'm going to lay a rock, a cornerstone, Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did he say next? I love these words. It gives me chills to think about it. Do you remember? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Somehow, we've gotten the whole thing turned in reverse. What Jesus was presenting to, for them was a visual image of hell in full retreat. So when they finally reach their end and their gates are up trying to stop the onslaught, which is the church, the movement of God for the salvation of the world, he says when they finally have retreated to their, first, their final last bunker, they can't stop us. We're going to bust right through. And somehow the modern church has gotten in reverse. All of this world is encroaching on us. We withdraw, and we withdraw, and we withdraw, and we withdraw, and we build churches that aren't centers of evangelistic energy and effort. They're not, they're not catalysts to a movement. They're places where people can get together in little religious clubs with people that are like them and that they like, and we can put up the walls, and we can make it hard for people to be a part of us, and we can say, you know what? If we do this right, um, we bar these doors, and hell cannot prevail against us. And here's what God is calling us to be. He's calling us to be a part of the very thing that he's been doing from the beginning, and it hasn't stopped yet. Here's what God is doing in the world. I, I want to give you a homework assignment, Okay. Some of you are, will be looking for something good to do with your family tonight, and some scriptures to read this week in, in devotional time, or, or something to do with your spouse. I want you to go to Acts chapter 13, and I want you to read these verses. You write the reference down, you can read them later. Acts 13, start in verse 13, and read through verse 49. And as you're reading that passage, I want you to be asking yourself this question, what in the world is God doing? Because here Paul the author of this letter lays it out to the first century church. He says, I want you to see what you're a part of here. And this is not cold theology I'm giving you. When you see what you're a part of, you'll see what you've got to do. You'll see what your role is. So here's the way Paul lays out. I'm giving you an outline in your notes. God, after creation, calls a man by the name of Abraham. And he says, I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you. And out of Abraham, he births a nation, a people, a people that are not his people exclusively, but a model people, a people who are called by God to reflect God, to show God's glory. I'm going to put my stamp on you, and you're going to carry my reputation to the world. People are going to think of me, what they see of me in you. By the way, that's still true of the church today. He says, you're my people. You're my missionary people. I'll call you Israel. Israel. God begins to build their identity through the giving of laws and a community of what it means to be a community of God. They get taken into captivity as a people. But even in the worst of their history, this brutal slavery under the Egyptians, during that period of time, God in His sovereignty is still working out a plan. 
Even in the worst of the worst and the lowest of the low in your life, God never stops working. And so here is God, even under the brutal whip of their Egyptian masters, God is building their numbers. And they're growing stronger and stronger. And they're protected from the famine that has spread throughout the land. And they're growing so large that when God does deliver them through Moses, they are a people to be reckoned with. A people of millions. And God delivers them out and takes them into the promised land and gives them that land as a place. He puts over them judges to rule them and to direct them and to protect them. Men like Gideon and Samson, Deborah and Barak. And then he brings along a prophet. A prophet, a spokesperson without fear for God. A warrior prophet named Samuel. And the direction of God and hearing the request of the people, Samuel ushers in the age of the kings. And the young man that Samson is drawn to by God, his name is David. And God gives this King David a promise that through you is going to be a line that's going to go all the way to the Messiah. And this throne, this king, is never going to end. Through you will come the Savior of the world. His name is Jesus. And then Paul declares to those folks in Acts, this Jesus was crucified, which you well know. You're his contemporaries. This is not an anxious story. This just happened. He was resurrected, and this you also know. And he's coming again, and he's accomplishing his purpose. And that purpose is beautifully described in the opening section of this letter to the Colossians. And I want to give you two words today. I want to give you two words today that from this day forward, from this day forward at Calvary Baptist Church, when people ask you, what is your church about? What do you people do there? When you invite someone to your life group and they say, well, what's it all about? What, what do y'all do? These two words will come to mind. When somebody says, well, what do you do with kids? I, I know you're having that thing you call vacation Bible school. What's it about? What's it for? These two words will come to mind. And everything we do, every ministry we do, will fall in line with these two things that God is doing. And God is doing them through His church. Not independently of His church, not through any other means. There is one plan of God to carry out His purpose in the world, and the vehicle is the church. And that's us. It's not an organization. It's not a complex of buildings. It's you and it's me doing what God has called us to do together. And these are the two words. The first word is transferring. Transferring. God, through the gospel, through the truth of who Jesus is, is doing the greatest miracle of all. He's transferring people who are in a kingdom of darkness, and he's transferring them into a kingdom of light. How many of you today are glad that you're the company that transferred? Without hope, without life, without God in this world is the way that Paul described it to the Ephesians. But God, who is rich in mercy towards us, in the sending of His Son, who died and rose again for us, has done a miracle, and He's taken us out of hopelessness and put us into hope. Darkness into light. Sinfulness, only deserving judgment, to forgiveness, getting what we don't deserve, which is the grace and mercy and love and company of and reward of God. Transferring. Transferring. It's much like Paul said in the end of that Acts passage. He said, let it be known to you, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything by which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. He says, if I were just to teach you morals and values, okay, if I were just to give you a religion of, of self-righteousness and works, if I were to say, okay, do this, 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 and this, stop doing this, this, and this, all that would ultimately do would be able to wrap you in bonds so tight you could not extricate yourself. Because the higher we raise the level of what true goodness is, all the way to Jesus, when we finally get it and stop being stubborn and we realize I could never reach that, we're left in hopelessness. Because what do we do now? What do we do now? He says this law can only point you to Christ and your need for a forgiver, a savior. He says, but everyone who believes this is freed. You're freed from the bonds of sin and be, been given a relationship with Christ. It's a ministry of transferring. If we are not part of seeing people transferred from darkness to light, 
We give up the right to be a biblical church. We stop being biblical. We stop being a light in a dark world. We stop being a city set on a hill. We stop being the salt of the earth. We can call ourselves whatever we like, but we're not a church. Because the church of God is about taking those people who are in darkness, sharing them this, with them this news of the gospel, the very same thing that saved you. So God can do the miracle of transferring. Ripping them out of the camp of the enemy. Planting them firmly in His camp. And keeping them there. But there's another part of this. There's a ministry of transforming. Transforming. There's a picture here of what God wants for us. Now that you have been saved, it's not just a ticket punch to eternity. It's not just my number has been called, now I'm good to go. i got to walk worthy of this gift that's been given to me. And not only do I have to, I want to. Because God is at work in me. And there's a beautiful uh, description here of discipleship. It's a real picture of, of what someone growing in Christ looks like. You can fill these blanks in with, with me quickly this morning. He says, I want you to be filled with knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. How many of you would be willing to say today, I, I, wish, I, had more, I wish I had more biblical knowledge. I mean, I wish I had more spiritual wisdom. You know, when people ask me questions, I wish I could come up with an answer quick or point them to where it is in Scripture. Um, I, I, I'm sitting in a Bible study and someone says, you know, I, I know it says here somewhere, um, God helps those who help themselves. No, you're looking for Sir Richard's Almanac. That's not in here. How many of you say, I wish I had more biblical knowledge and wisdom I could share with people? Listen, I know I set you up a little bit. There's no shortcut to that. There's only one man in history that got it in a flash. His name was Paul, not me. Everyone else gets it through study, through the work. There are treasures to be mined here, but they will never be dug out by the lazy or the casual or the disinterested. And I think sometimes we have this idea, maybe this is a metaphor that will fit for you. You think of this Bible, and it's a, it's a, it's a buffet line laid out by your church. So you can come by and pick through. I need a little of this and a little of that. I'll take a piece of this. I want you to think of it as a treasure that's there for you if you'll dig for it. Study. So this is discipleship. Get into this word and know this word. Know this truth. Because there's a beautiful relationship between knowledge and its impact when it comes to Scripture. Because God's word has got promises attached to it to accomplish the purpose of, of the sending of it. And the more I know it, the more I begin to be changed by it. He says, fill with knowledge of his will, fully pleasing to him. How, how am I fully pleasing to him? It's by taking what I know and doing it. It's by obedience. It's through obedience. Sometimes I get a little frustrated when people say, you know, I, I think we need to have some, we need some deeper Bible studies. I want, I want to get in a class where we can go deeper. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with plunging the depths, digging in hard. But what I'm not okay with, and I'm sure God is not, is that when we know what we ought to do, and we don't do it. In fact, I think there's a scripture about that, right? It says, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is what? Sin. Some pastors say the average Christian knows ten times more than he ever does. It's not about information. It's about obedience to be fully pleasing. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. When I think of fruit, the fruit at its most basic and obvious level is evidence. It's evidence of a thing. It's, it's evidence of the health of a thing. It's evidence that a thing is fulfilling its purpose. And I put in your notes today the word service, but maybe put in parentheses beside that the word action. Because I'm talking about the doing of a thing, not just the knowing of a thing. I I could give lots of people in our community a pop quiz about the basics of what Christianity is. Let's hit the big points here. And I imagine a lot of people could probably score okay on the pop quiz and feel pretty good about themselves. But what do we say about those whose knowledge has never affected behaviors? That can say that they're a Christian but live in indistinctly from the rest of the world or have never been changed themselves. It it doesn't do anything. And not only does it not do anything in them, but they don't do anything. There there ought to be something about your relationship with Christ 
that makes you want to do something. And when I say service, sometimes service can be reduced to something that's just the checking off of a box. You say, oh, I did my service. I changed diapers just last week over there. I'm a VIP. I, I'm, I'm glad that you did that. I, I took up the offering. I, I teach. Sometimes we can put our lives in little boxes and we say, well, I know this. And on Sundays I do this. Check. I'm not talking about a, 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 a one hour. I'm talking about a life of action that shows that I'm, I'm really a Christian. Now, this is not just my opinion. I'll share with you a far greater expert who shares it with me in just a moment. But I think we've got a lot of confused at best and deceived at worst so-called Christians who think they're fine with God because of some information they possess when there is no fruit, no evidence, no life of action that says, there's a king over my life and it's not me and I do what he wants me to do. In fact, the expert on this is probably a guy that you know well. His name is James. He wrote a book. In that book about faith, James says this. He says, you show me your faith and you know, what it is you say you believe, and I'll show you my works. Because here's the equation you need to understand. Faith without works is dead. That's not real. That's not alive. So it's bearing fruit. He says, strengthen for all endurance and patience with joy. Strengthen for all endurance and patience with joy. Through perseverance, we honor God. One of the most beautiful things that you will ever do to honor God with your life is to faithfully love Him, obey Him, and serve Him all your life over a long span, no matter what happens. No matter what happens. Now I want to do something this morning. Are there any people in this room who have been a Christian for 50 years or more? We got any 50 years or more? So I was, I've been a Christian for, for 50 years. Will you just stand just for a moment, if you will? Just stand if you don't mind, just for a moment. I'm going to tell you how every person in this room can give honor and glory to God. I don't know many of the stories of the people you see standing here, but their lives have not been easy. Their lives have not been without pain. You're seeing people who have lost children and spouses. They've gone through sickness and hardship. They've, they've, they've gone through things you won't even imagine. But here they stand, still loving God, still following God. You know what that is evidence of? That is evidence of the reality of a person's faith who says, God, no matter what, I'm going to love you. And how does that happen? That's the work of a disciple. Y'all can be seated. That all of us would do this over an extended span of time, that's perseverance. And then there's gratitude, giving thanks to the Father. He said, that's, that's discipleship. So listen, again, these two words. Transferring. If we're not doing the ministry of transferring, we're not doing what God called the church to do in transforming. And see, here's this one big goal. There's this one big goal, and I want you to look at this on the back of your page. I presented it as, as two arrows on your page. Two arrows with a line in between, and here's the constant goal of a real church. It's the constant goal of Calvary now. It's going to mark everything that we do, and it's going to be how we measure things. Are we moving people from darkness to light? Are we moving people from meism, which is something I just sort of made up, but it's the religion of self, pleasing me, to becoming like Christ like, becoming like Christ? What's the constant goal, the challenge? Keep moving people to the right. Keep moving them down that line. Whatever stage we find them, let's keep moving them. Let, let, let's treat our guests, let's treat newcomers that come around us like gold, knowing that they're a precious gift to us, that they're chosen and loved by God, and let's teach them and let's move them until they get to the point where they say, yes, I believe, I trust Him. And let's you and I, as believers, those of you who are in Christ, let's recommit ourselves to growing, to keep moving down that line. Let's keep doing it. How do we participate in this work? How do we participate in this work of God? I want to give you three things, and then I'm going to move quickly to a conclusion. How do you and I participate in this according to what Paul is writing here, according to what the big picture of God's plan is? Let me tell you the three things, and these are the things that are going to mark us as a people and I hope will mark you as an individual. One is this. We have to teach and trust God's Word. Teach it and trust it. And let me tell you what I mean. I mean not casually referring to it. I mean not having it as the background in what we do. But the measure of what we do, whether it's with the smallest children, 
through the senior most among us, that we make sure that the ministry of the Word is foundational. You see, there are a lot of things that a church can spend its time and energies doing. There are a lot of activities and programs. You have a lot of opinions, a lot of passions. There are a lot of things that we could use our resources and our funding and, and our time and our buildings, all those things for. There are only two things that have been exclusively given to the church by God. And as a result of those two things exclusively being given by God, there's only two things that God's going to measure us on. And it's transferring and transforming people. And we do this with the Word. And sometimes this is slow. But you know what? We're never going to, as Paul said, we're never going to subvert this word by gimmicks. We're never going to shortcut it and think, that doesn't work this day anymore. We're going to believe exactly what Paul told the Colossians. He said, this gospel that you believed and that when you understood it, you believed it, the same gospel is, that's just blowing up all over the world. You know what? It's still blowing up all over the world. And we've got to trust it. We've got to trust that in due season, we'll reap a harvest if we don't faint. If we don't stop sowing the seed of the word, we're going to get a harvest from it. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to teach and trust the word. Second thing is this, we've got to pray. We've got to pray that God would work through the gospel and awaken hearts. And let me say this just as a caution to you for a moment. Sometimes prayer becomes for us a cliche without meaning. It's almost as if, you know, when the preacher starts talking about prayer, he's got nothing else to talk about. You can't go wrong with prayer, right? Oh, and uh, pray more. Listen, what I'm talking about is this. I'm talking about the powerful effect of prayer and for our purposes today, not just on the object of prayer, not on the person you're praying for or the situation you're praying about. I'm talking about the power of prayer on the prayer. Because when you start praying for your church every day, when you start praying that God may our church be a place where we will see people transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. God may our church be a place where people release, uh, release their selfishness and self-centeredness and become more and more like you. It is hard to complain about that thing which I'm praying for. It's hard to be against it. It's hard to stir up problems within it. Because I see myself as part of this big thing that is so much bigger than me. And God, forgive me for making this about me, but God, I'm going to make it about you, and I'm going to pray for it. My eyes to my own church are going to be different. And when I'm praying for the people I work with, I don't see them the same. It's not that annoying person in the cubicle beside me who never returns my stapler. It's a person who needs Christ. It, it, my neighbor, it, it's, not, it's not my annoying neighbor who cuts his tree down and leaves it on my property. It's my neighbor that I need to talk to because they need to know Christ, and I see them differently because I'm praying for them. And when I start praying for my city, and listen, and, and I know I'm short on time, so y'all just hang with me today. When I'm praying for my city, I stop being interested in just having a better church than other people. I don't care a lick about that. I don't care a bit how our church compares to other churches. I care about this. God, am I walking worthy of you who saved me? And God, am I fully pleasing you? Because what I want to see is more than a great Calvary. What I want to see is a move of God to the city of Dothan, where people begin to wonder from other places, what's happening in that city? I want people coming to the city to see what God is doing here. Because we're praying for it. We're praying for the city. And I want when you come in these doors on a Sunday morning or when you walk into your life group, that you are going in there praying, God, today, open hearts and eyes to see you. Awaken people to the gospel. Pray like that prayer I prayed for you this morning. That I pray every single Sunday. Today's just the first time I prayed aloud. I pray every single Sunday sitting there. God, when this word is open, may that word be like flame. and May people's hearts be like grass. Dean Martin Lloyd-Jones said that. I said, that's what we need to expect. And you pray for that. You pray. But we, it, it's, not just the, it's not just the teaching and the praying, though. There's one other thing. One other thing that can cause all of our grandiose plans and all of our great teaching and all of our strategizing to collapse in rubble. And that's if you, and I'm pointing to the many yous, if we don't live in a way that's fully pleasing to God in a manner worthy of what he's done for us, it can collapse. Here's what I think. I think in this room are a lot of people who are very serious about using the rest of what they've got for the rest of their life to please God. There's some people in this room that don't care a bit about playing church. They care about standing before the Almighty one day and hearing good job. There are some people in this room that really want to make a difference in this community and they care about the reputation of God. And some of you in this room, through selfishness, through lust, through compromise, your decisions 
are going to undermine the work of some of those people that they're pouring their lives into. You're going to undermine the work of a church because you believe those ridiculous lies the enemy tells that, hey, it's nobody's business but yours. It's not going to hurt anybody but you. We are a body. We're a body. We're the called out of God to impact the world for God. We got to live. You've got a personal responsibility to live right. You don't have the right. You don't have the right to besperse the reputation of God. You don't have the right to have people in this city think badly of Calvary because of your decisions. You don't have that right. You're about something much bigger than you. Don't you see? God created a world, He chose a people. He delivered those people. He gave them a king. He promised them a Messiah. He sent a Messiah. That Messiah died and rose again. That Messiah is coming back so that all would put their faith and trust in him. We got to live in a way that's pleasing to God by being partners with God in that work and making sure that what we do does not discredit it. So I'm trusting God's word. I want to make sure it permeates everything that we do from top to bottom. I'm praying I'm praying that God's going to do what only God can do. But we've got to make sure that what we're doing verifies it by how we live. So what's the implication for us? Well, there are many, and I'll share these with you in the coming weeks, particularly next Sunday night when we share our vision for the future and our budget and ministry plans. But ultimately, I want you to think about this. You and I need to have a grander sense of God's purpose for us and a grander sense of God's purpose for this church. Okay, here's what I'm saying. I'm going to close. You've got to have a grander sense of the church than an organization that exists to please you. We will never be opposed to you. But the church does not exist for me and for you. We've got to have a grander sense of the purpose of this church than just to answer my every whim and respond to my every complaint and to do things like I want it to do. Folks, we don't have time to turn our energies inward. We don't have time to fight with each other. We don't have time to debate what we're going to do and what we're going to be about. we got a mandate. we got an opportunity. We're part of the big picture. We're part of Abraham through David, through Jesus, through Paul to us. we got to do that. And you and I have to have this sense that this is not about my personal satisfaction. When you think of those two terms, what is worthy and pleasing to God? Worthy is what's appropriate to God. Pleasing is for God's enjoyment, not my own. We've got to remember our church, this church that you're a part of, this church exists for God. Walk worthy of Him. Fully pleasing Him. This church exists for this city. This is our mission field. You are missionaries in this mission field right here. Until God sends you somewhere else, this is your mission field. We exist for this city, but we exist for more than that. We exist for the world. It matters to the world what we do in here. Let's pray.